Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Dark Souls 2. Faram is here in the Undead Crypt, wearing the actual Faram set, and wielding both the ancestral weapons of the Faram Lion Knights. I know it's been a while since I've done anything, but there have been a few logistical problems with recording and internet access that have uh, sort of cleared up as of late, so I'm ready to get back to making new recordings and playing through the game. Faram is just about done with the playthrough, but it is the 25th just today, and the Old Iron King DLC has just released, so we've got that to look forward to. I'm actually gonna... I, I thought about it for a while and decided that I wanted to record my blind run on Faram himself at soul level 50 150 and you know s see what this is like I'm gonna this is gonna be the first time I actually record a blind um, DLC impression so I'm really interested to see what it is all, all that's new especially because the last DLC was so great here I'm just gonna be wailing on Vendrick for a while. It's it's a long fight, but I've got all five giant souls, so it shouldn't take too long. There's a few things to be done in the base game before I'm quite done. Of course, I need to face the Throne Watcher Defender and Chandra right after this, but I'm also going to ascetic the Lost Sinner boss fight in order to get Flame Weapon for this uh, first new game section. I think that it would look really great on the Red Iron Twin Blade. And I have the slots for it, so why not add a buff damage to that? The Red Rust Sword itself isn't actually upgraded because I didn't quite have enough Twinkling Titanite for it. So as you can see, I'm just abusing the Red Rust Scimitar. It's got a much better move set, but it has less damage overall, so it takes just a smidge longer. The moveset's really nice because it actually uses the legit uh, curved sword moveset, giving you the really nice sprinting attack. You can use it to parry really quickly. It just has very quick, snappy attacks. It's a really nice weapon to complement a strength build just because most strength weapons take quite a bit and have a little bit of a wind-up. It can be very difficult to play around with, whereas the Red Rust Scimitar has all the advantages of a curve sword, but with higher stamina costs and strength scaling and damages, so it's a really nice intermediary. Let's head on over to Sinner's Rise and the Salt Fort. Aesthetic that up and head right on down. I decided to vary up the build a little bit just to showcase some of the other things that I'm going to be using with the character and have I? Do I really have two Sublime Bone Dust that I just haven't burned yet? Really? This done cannot be undone. There we are. I do indeed. Oh goodness. I'm so good at that. Yeah. I, I, I've said it before, but that is one of my weaknesses. I oftentimes just completely forget to use those. After this, I'm going to head back to Majula, spend those. Um, honestly, I'm probably going to want to head back to the things betwixt and use another soul vessel in order to get my, <laughs> bye, and get my dex up to 23, I believe it is. A sword. Yes, it's 23 in order to dual wield these weapons. That's going to be very useful because it'll kind of complete the cosplay. Uh, Vengarl definitely dual wields them, and I, I would believe that the war god Faram would, of course, be strong enough to dual wield these weapons. I mean, it, it would very much shock me if that were not the case. It's been brought up in the comments by one of the viewers, but um, the reason I don't actually use the Faram set for the regular just cosplay of the build is because the Faram set is not actually the set of Faram himself, it's the set honoring Faram worn by his followers, the Lion Knights. 
of Ferosa. So it's it's not like it's actually a canonical bit, bit of equipment that Ferram himself would use were he to be incarnate. It's actually just a uh, in game. It's a sort of oh goodness. It's worn in honor of Ferram. It represents him and his patronage over the Feroz and Lion Knights. It's not actually anything specific. As such, I think that uh, Vengarl set is actually a much better set for cosplaying Ferram, just because it not only has an incredibly warlike look to it and red, bloody, it's, it's almost like Ares. As, as you would imagine him from olden Greek mythology, Ares would, was the god of war and would come down into battle to fight alongside the mortals. And I very much believe that he would have been rather gaudy and flashy, very warlike, so to speak. This is my last resin. I can just buy more. and In fact, that's why I'm having this little fight, so that I don't have to buy more. So I can just use the uh, flame weapon spell. But as I was saying, Vengarl's set. Oh, come on. What is that? Hitboxes, come on. But Vengarl's set is, looks extremely warlike. It's very red, very in your face. And not only that, but Vengarl himself was the paragon of the Frozen Lion Knights. He was the creme de la creme. As. At as his proving, he actually took up both the red rust swords and wielded them as if they were nothing when the two red rust swords, both the scimitar and just the regular red rust sword, were used as tests of strength two-handed for the Ferocian Lion Knights to prove their strength upon their initiation. Like, if you could wield one of them, then you were strong enough to finally be considered a knight. And Vengarl came in and immediately picked up both, power stanced them, at least that's what we're led to believe, and started swinging them around as, this, as if they were nothing. He immediately rose to prominence and became an absolute beast on the battlefield. All he knew in life was war, and he was damn good at it. He was an incredible mercenary, and was greatly acclaimed in his life, but no matter, the, his kingdom was falling, and soon he was scattered across Strang Lake. Eventually, I don't, don't want to level up. Eventually, he came into the employ of Lord Seldora, though we don't actually know if that's before or after he was beheaded. Nor do we know exactly how he continues to live after being beheaded, but I think it's very, very safe to say that Aldia is involved in there somewhere. Not only can you see from his body down in the basement of Seldora, but um, he is a massive man. He's actually far larger than average. How much twinkling? Yeah, I, d I don't have very much twinkling. But um, he's an incredibly large man, and in Dark Souls 2, the size of people is actually... Uh, if it deviates from average, like me or Cloan here or Lenagrast over here, if it deviates from average, like with the Dragon Riders or the Cyan Knights, it's almost invariably because of Aldea's experimentation. There, to my knowledge, are no uh, human enemies in the entire game that are larger than the base unit like myself who haven't been altered by Aldea's wicked methods. His experimentation was vile and evil and torturous and all sorts of other cruel words but in the end he produced results. He got things done. People were affected. People were made powerful. And it is extremely clear the effect that he had upon Drang Lake. I'm probably going to take all three points out of vitality. It's not a super important 
stat to have. You know... No, I, I was considering taking them out of attunement and just settling for two slots, but that would mean I would have to put things into a, more into adaptability to get what I was looking for. So it, it, in the end, it would kind of cancel out the usefulness of it. There we go. There we go. Get my human effigies. Wonderful. Power stance. Gonna have to go to see Strayed now. Grab my actual flame weapon pyromancy. Such a good pyromancy. It, unlike all the other elemental buffs, it actually has four casts for a single attunement, which is incredibly useful. It actually allows you to use it in PVE a lot like you would with Great Magic Berry. I'm not sorry, but uh, Great Magic Weapon or just Magic Weapon on its own. Whereas, uh, Dark Weapon, oh, I suppose Dark Weapon as well. I'm, I'm more thinking of Sunlight Weapon, since that's the, uh, and Resonant Weapon, since those are the strongest, and Crystal Magic Weapon, which are the strongest elemental buffs in their field. So I, I suppose it's sort of in line with the, uh, lesser buffs, but it's it's still just something to note, and it is kind of stand out in a really good way. Can I grab that? I don't know. I don't need any of these. Uh, do I want any of this? Coming back through, I, I do I do want the gargoyles by dent, just because spears have become so powerful, and I, I've always wanted it to be a useful weapon. I, I don't think it is yet, but by golly, I want it to be. I'm just grabbing a bunch of stuff that I... I've got plenty of souls, and I can't spend them on levels, so... I'm just grabbing anything that kind of strikes my fancy. Anything else? No. Any spells I want? No. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Strayed. Give me your equipment, and that is all I will be needing you for. Tune spells. Let's get my flame weapon. And what else do I want to attack on there? I could use lingering flame. But... Great combustion and flame, fire whip. Those are some of my more favorite pyromancies. Let's just go with those. Okay. Ah, that's right. Time to face the big bads of the playthrough. Coming down here to finish the game in grand style as Faram himself dual wielding the Faram weapons. Uh, well, the Ferocin weapons, the Red Rust Scimitar and Red Rust Sword. And uh, here we are. Let me in. And, well, it is going to be a bit of a long walk, but say lovey. Let's get my Pyromancy Flame equipped. I found out that the Dark Pyromancy Flame is actually the wrong Pyromancy Flame. Its scaling is deceptive, and the base is deceptive in that it only uh, has that full v those full values if you're at a measure of hollowing. So, yeah, kind of a little bit of a waste. Let's see. I, I don't have enough fire seeds to switch over, so I'll just use it for now. But uh, if I ever take the time to really refine this build and keep playing with it, then I am going to eventually switch that over to the proper uh, Pyromancy Flame. In fact, I would be extremely surprised if this new DLC, the Iron King the crown of the iron king doesn't have a lot of fire seeds within it so fingers crossed there we are oh that was a poor trade not gonna follow up I'm just trading oh, <laughs> oh. 
Okay, I, I may have gotten a little bit overconfident there. That first trade with the Throne Defender really made me think that I could get off those damage trades and come out ahead. But, as you saw, they, they saw that little bit of impudence and said, <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, if, if you try to just trade with us using your little Power Stance moveset, we will shred you to pieces. You still have to play smart, play it safe, take a little bit of extra time, but uh, otherwise we will kill you, so. Let's try that again and try and play it smart this time. See if that helps us out any. I hate these uh, channelots here. Just finish off her dialogues. Just because I want to... The door always takes so long. It's... So annoying. I get that it's supposed to build up tension, but when you're on your 10th, 20th, 30th run, it just becomes annoying. It's you, you, you don't need to, you shouldn't be made to sit there through all that. It's a big grandiose display that's really, really lackluster and just slow. I do like the mechanic and the throwback to the Lord Vessel and all the lore that's behind that, the King's Ring, but. Uh, per item already covered that, and I already linked that specific video, so I'm not going to talk too much more about it. Just the fact that I enjoy the lore implications there, but it still doesn't mean I have to enjoy the mechanic. Because the mechanic is just very slow and annoying and drawn out and overblown, really. So, blech. Oh. Here we are. It's a little bit difficult, and the problem with this fight is that you need to be keeping track of both of them at once, which can be difficult, especially because they have very, very large range. Like, incredibly large range. They really demonstrate... Oh, goodness. That combo. Okay, so at least I know they take damage really nicely. But not only do they have great swords, which already have really great range and versatility. Both of them are wielding great swords, but uh, the especially big problem with them is that they're oversized characters. Their weapons are bigger than even regular player weapons. Something to note, though, is that they're actually opposite-handed. Um, the Throne Defender here is right-handed, shielding with his left hand, but the Throne Watcher herself is actually using her great sword in her left hand. It's not something particular. Oh goodness, this is bad. This is bad. Once they've both buffed, you're really needing to play it safe because their damage output just skyrockets. The hits off. I don't roll too late on that one. Oh dear. As you can see, they're really getting uppity. I can no longer be taking stupid trades because their damage is finely enough to punish that really, really hard. So I need to be keeping. Oh dear. Keeping my range. Okay, now I can come in and hack him down. And f when they're one at a time, it's a piece of cake. The fight's over. This is... that's all she wrote. Gonna dual stance it for the cool factor alone. Abuse that part of the build. And there you have it. Life gem just to hold on to these Estus flasks. Do I have the curse bite ring? Tell me I do. I do not. Oh well. We're gonna face her the old-fashioned way, I guess. There we are. You can come here, little lady. I'm not gonna look around with your curse orbs. If you break the orb and then come in close enough, she'll start this little mid-range... Oh, not quite. Humbug. 
But I'm, I'm trying to lure her to start walking over here instead of just laser blasting me, but she doesn't seem like she's having any of it. Well, I guess I'll just have to fight her right here and roll backwards instead of rolling sideways. Because rolling sideways is going to... There we are. Now I can roll around, because I, I don't want to get caught in her curse orbs. But at the same time, I want to draw her into melee combat. Walking is always better than dodging if you can avoid the damage that way. Allows you to keep your stamina. Oh, that was just bad. There we are. Oh, did she not lay one behind herself? Perfect. Gives us this whole section to fight around. Quite honestly, it's stupid for me to be dual wielding. It's going to do less damage than if I was just two handing the uh, scimitar. But, ow, ow. I want it for rule of cool. I just think it's a much more interesting style. It's a little bit more challenging. Makes me play a little bit smarter because I have to focus on having a really longer weapon animation. And it takes up more stamina. It's, it's, it's really just for the cosplay and the challenge of the fact uh, of the two weapons being suboptimal. Gonna make some range and heal. It's just a pretty long fight at this point. Her defenses are rather good versus these admittedly low power weapons. They're very good for staggering and they've got a lot of utility especially together but they're not for just bursting someone down. Oh, wasn't expecting her to go for the three hit. You gonna you gonna laser blast me? Nope, you're gonna summon your orbs. Fantastic. Oh, that was bad. Ah, I wanted to make it through the whole fight without getting cursed, but no dice. Let's see if I can break this one too. I did. There we go. This should be dead if I'm counting it right. Yeah, there we have it human on up. I am going to switch over to the proper Vengarl set before uh, we actually end this off. And quite honestly, I don't actually think I'm going to end it off since I'm going to be heading through the DLC now. I'm, I'm not going to get the credits. I can always come back to that. I think it would be silly to drag us through the credits right there, but uh oh. Oh. Is is it is it not gonna is it not gonna let me out? <laughs> I have to go through the credits. I'll be that way. Oh well. Looks like we're stuck. Hopefully I can skip the credits, but uh we'll see don't remember if there's a very specific way to do that. There we are. There's my twin blade. Flame weapon just for cool factor again. This, this is how Faram would look in my mind. He's got his massive red iron twin blade lit up with fire, wearing full berserkers, really heavy armor. That's that's what really speaks to me. And there we have it. That's Dark Souls 2 completed. At least on just regular New Game. New Game Plus is coming up after this, but uh, not just yet. We still have a DLC to go through. Um, I don't think that I'm going to have too much to say through all these credits, so I'm just going to cut it here, either cut it or leave a timestamp for you to skip it should you choose, but yeah, thank you for watching. Uh, it's a full clear of the first Sunken Crown DLC as well as the regular base game from Dark Souls 2.
And we're back. Once more into the breach, as they say, and I've got my proper build and am ready to head out into the world. Before we... I could have sworn it said I had... Okay, I've, I already burned my sublime button dust. That's good. You know, before I head out, let's buy up all the things I can in Medulla. Just because I have the money for it. Uh, I certainly don't need any more slabs. I don't need these for anything yet, but uh, they're nice to have in case I think of any other weapons I'd like to use on the character. And that'll be enough to fully upgrade three weapons, whatever I choose them to be. Neither of these are any worth. So, let's see, Melentia. Any armor sets that I need? Now let's get Pate's Great Shield. I already got Creighton set, and I hate Peyton's look. The only part of it that are any good is the uh, chest piece, and possibly the leggings. But because they're just ported directly from Dark Souls 1, they actually look... Ex oh, I haven't... I haven't gotten his inventory unlocked? Really? That's silly. Let's let's get that done with. I want to be able to buy all the boss armors. But um as I was saying, the Pate set is the simply the uh warrior set from Dark Souls 1, and because it's just copied straight over, it actually looks incredibly out of place because the uh leather and the metal is a little bit brighter than most of the armor and sets in Dark Souls 2, so it's very hard to actually fit that with anything else. It looks okay on its own, but actually fitting that with another set is incredibly difficult. Let's get all these bits of armor. Were that not the case, I wouldn't actually mind it, because I think it looks pretty nice. Oh, goodness. I also like the uh, Royal Soldier set, aside from the leggings. But I'll buy them for completeness sake. I don't want to uh, do a cosplay halfway, so if I ever try and sport any of the Royal Soldier's equipment, I'm going to want the full set. But there we are. I, I Again, I really do like the way that Pate's set looks. It's just... I never like to copy a uh, set wholesale if I'm doing fashion souls. If I'm doing a cosplay, I will. But if I'm doing fashion souls, copying a set wholesale just feels unoriginal and bland. So, yeah. It's, it, that's that's why I can't really stand paint set. Bits of it would look nice, but the, the thing as a whole just kind of fails for me. You know what? Considering I'm at uh, the soul level that I'm really gonna want to stick at, let's let's swap out from the soul gathering ring to a uh, little bit more appropriate, um, what we call it, drop gathering ring, so that I can get any special drops that might be coming my way here in the Iron Keep. I am heading over here real quick just so that I can get the king set now that I've actually killed Vendrick I'm already human so I don't have to worry about that and I can just quickly deal with these mages I, I really think that Amana gets a bad name for the mages because they're, they're fairly easy to dodge it's just the problem is when you're throwing mages at you when you're already facing several of the uh, Lindelt clerics. That, I do think, is unfair. The Lindelt clerics can stagger you so easily that having multiples of them coming at you at a time is already incredibly difficult, and depending upon how you actually take on that encounter right before Roy's resting place, uh, it's it's basically unavoidable to take on those clerics while facing a uh, priestess of a mana plinking away at you. It's a very frustrating setup, but nothing to really be done about that. 
There we go. I have the whole king set. Age feather on out. And now I'm ready to face the DLC. This is where the spoilers kind of start, people. So if you're averse to that, you might want to back out now. You've had the full run thus far. We've gone through the first DLC. And now I'm looking to plunge my way into the second one. Let's probably not going to get too far before I have to kind of stop the episode, but I at least want to make my way in and get a feel for what it's going to be like. I've managed to avoid every single spoiler for the DLC thus far, so I'm coming into this incredibly fresh and really thirsty for all the uh, new content that From gave us, or sold to us. I suppose they didn't give us anything. <laughs> Well, that's one way to get dunked on. Honestly, a twin blade's a terrible weapon for fighting in a hallway, and there was no real way to make that easy, I guess. But uh, I, I certainly didn't need to take damage there. That just kind of happened. Ooh, look at that. That is new. And oh, oh. We even get more slabs. Let's, let's see what these say. Forbidden is the path to the ancient king's domain. With water dry and path amiss, woeful temptation is dismissed. Water dry? Is that talking about lava, or is that... Or is there going to be a water mechanic? In the tower of the old iron king resides a child of dark... Okay, yeah. Definitely keeping going with the shards of manas here. Trespassers will face adversity befitting a monarch. Yeah. It, these, that's why is why is that bubbling? There's something in the middle of there that I haven't seen so far. I haven't I haven't seen that in the middle of the uh, other founts. I I don't. It it could be that that was there before, but I guess I just never noticed it per se. But as I was saying, those uh, a adversity befitting a monarch is oh these graves, huh? These graves again. I don't know if they're reusing assets or demarcating that these. This is has something to do with the uh, oh the sign written here is being channeled from somewhere far away. This is a developer message because I am in offline mode right now. The servers are down. Sign written here is being. Oh, oh! I think that's. I I need to be connected to the servers to see what's going on here. I don't don't rightly know, but it is weird that these grave markers can be found in Shulva as. Excuse me. What? C closed. <laughs> I have the season pass. Is it is it not going to give it to me? Okay. Uh, apparently, it doesn't recognize that I have the DLC. Did they not give me a new item for that? Doesn't look like I have a new key item for that yet. So, huh? Usually, they just dump that in your inventory, but um. Well, now I feel like an idiot. Well, while I'm here, I, I, gu I guess this is where we're going to leave off the episode. You get to see this first little bit. That's, that's all you get. It's just a little bit of a teaser. But, um, yeah. Something I do want to note before I leave is these illustrations on this door that we find in all three DLC locations. Here in the old Iron Keep here in the uh, in Shulva, as well as the Shrine of Winter. I can't tell for certain, but I actually think that these three illustrations here on the door represent each of the DLCs. I can't tell for certain, but I believe the top one is supposed to be a depiction of Sin the Dragon, or some sort of bull. I can't quite tell which. The bottom illustration clearly looks like the outline 
of a bowl, which is why I declare the top one to be seeth. But uh, I mean sin, not seeth. Goodness, but it it looks a lot like a bowl with the uh, little fire brazier that all the fire spitting bowl statues have, and quite possibly a lick of flame right across from it. So I definitely think that's a strong connection to the old iron keep. But uh, the top one sort of looks like sin. And I'm very interested to see what the Ivor the uh, Ivory King crown, whatever, uh, has to do with that middle illustration there, because we, we don't actually know a lot about it. It certainly looks to be some sort of magus or uh, practitioner of soul arts doing something, but I can't quite tell which. It could be a healer. Guy kind of looks like he has only one leg, but right now there's really just nothing to match to that yet. We haven't seen that, and so there's not much for it. But uh, I guess this will be where I leave off. A little bit of a short episode, but there wasn't too much to be done, and I've taken care of all the housekeeping, beaten all the bosses, and that'll be it. I will be recording another episode as soon as I can figure out exactly how to open that the recalcitrant door over there and see what's what exactly is going on with the uh, signs here because I actually think that I need to be online or at least connected to the server for me to see those because I don't know it's a, it's a very strange sign message well we shall see thank you so much for watching and I will see you all next time